if you can do it that way. Pointing at your mouth. Anyway, yeah.
He won a sound test. Andre, is that what you said? Okay. Tim, do you want to sound, do a sound uh, test? Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Speak again, yes? Okay. You c I'm coming through okay? I can't hear me. On. It also on. It is on. Testing. If it conks out, but it seems to be okay now. No, no, this seems to be okay now. Yeah, but it's, it's more important that you keep going, Russell. Okay, well, do you want to swap? Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. So I will speak again. Oh, that comes through very clearly, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, does it come through all right uh, if I speak like this? Yeah. Okay, all good. Right here. Tim, you can sit down now. Is this one? I'll just do a little introduction. I'll just do a little yep. Please do right a little Tēnā koutou katoa. Um, Mike Smith's my name. Uh, uh, and it's my great pleasure on behalf of the Fabian Society tonight to present a talk by Dr. Tim Beale, who is going to speak on the challenge of Eurasia and multipolarity to American hegemony. Um, and I have to say, this topic, I think, is uh, vastly misunderstood, well not, un not understood, I'd have to say, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Th there's a huge tectonic changes going on around the world, and we are mostly completely uninformed about them. So tonight, in, in for me, is an exciting lecture because uh, we have Tim's expertise who's been writing about Asia. He tells me his first degree was in Chinese, then Japanese, then did marketing because it got him a job. Uh, and now he can do what he writes, likes and writes about the world. So I'm really looking forward uh, to your presentation tonight, Tim, and thank you very much for coming, and please give him a welcome. Oh, thank you, Mike. Before I start, a, a word of warning. This uh, presentation hasn't been audited by Radio New Zealand. <laughs> so you might want to leave now before I start. <laughs> Okay, um, I've got a lot of slides, and so I will, I will try and go through them uh, relatively quickly. Uh, what Mike left out when he read the, the heading is the, the third line, and the challenge of that to the world, and including New Zealand. Now, this all started... But there, yeah, uh, because Mike saw this little article of mine in Pearls and Irritation, I Irritations, which I would recommend. It's an Australian 
website, Australian Web Journal, uh, which covers a lot of the issues that you were, you were talking about. Yeah. So that's well worth looking at. And that, in fact, was a variation, a development of this more somber article. And there are copies, or there were copies, um, of there that available. The there are copies on the table down the back. Right, OK. Um, so, weaponizing Europe, countering Eurasia, uh, Mackinder, Brzezinski, Newland, and the road to the UK war. So, that's fairly topical. Um, so, what I want to do to tonight is I'm going to expand on that. I'm going to look not merely at Europe, but the other side of Eurasia, from Europe to East Asia. I'm going to develop the theme slightly, going from Eurasia to the question of multipolarity, uh, and then talk about the implication for New Zealand and the world about with that. Now let me start off with the, the element of continuity, which is U.S. hegemony. Now, U.S. hegemony, imperialism, primacy, leadership, the, the beast has many names. And basically, I'm just thinking it quite simply in terms of the power of one state over others. And the expansion, or the maintenance, of course they're intertwined, of hegemony is, as I see it, the principal driver of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, we can look at the various degrees of power, uh, which the degrees, the dimensions of power, the degree varies geographically and over time, power you know, goes up and down. The mode, whether it's uh, a direct power, as for instance the British Empire, Roman Empire, or whether it's more indirect. Uh, and then the various kinds of power, going from hard power, military power, dropping bombs, missiles, etc., right through to soft power, which of course takes us back to Radio New Zealand, because I mean that is an example of American soft power. I'm going to get used to this eventually. Have I jumped too many? No. Right. Um, just simply pointing out that power is, is, is not absolute. And I'm not going to go through this. But uh, this is something from the RAND Corporation, which is the United States Air Force think tank. Um, and uh, it gives you the, a number of countries on, on, the, on the left column, ver four different scenarios, conflict over Taiwan, a, a, a Korean War, Scarborough Clash, which is the South China Sea, and what they call a stability operation in Korea, which, by which they mean the collapse of, of the North Korea. Anyway, all sorts of variations. Um, so power is, is, is not fixed. It's very fluid, and it's... Uh, dependent on all sorts of factors. Yeah. Now I've gone too far. That's not going back, is it? Yeah. Oh, it has now. Oh, God. OK, Eurasia and hegemony. So Eurasia seems to me is the principal objective and challenge to U.S. hegemony at the moment. The objective is a matter of resources, energy, land, labor, and markets. And the challenge is that most of the countries challenging or resisting U.S. hegemony are in Eurasia, mainly, of course, China, Russia, Iran, uh, and others. So Eurasia is very, very, very central. It's not working, is it? Yeah, it is. Uh. Uh, can, you, can I can just you? flick it on with a... Um, yeah, I'll give it a new battery. A new battery. Always a good idea. Well, I've got t t two maps. Uh, this just gives lots, lots of countries. Um, so I won't go through them, but it's you know, fairly obvious that's what we're talking about. Um, can you put the next one on? 
and that's slightly more dramatic. Red has no political significance, but it shows you how big Eurasia is, and it also puts the rest of the world in, in, the, in the fray, which is, which is very important. Now, we'll see. Uh, did you buy these batteries cheap somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, I would tell you, okay, well that's, that's a simple way. Okay, let me say something about the importance of Eurasia to the United States. And here we have a quote straight from the horse's mouth. Dead horse now, but the horse. Um, and it's uh, Brzezinski. How America manages Eurasia is critical. Power that dominates Eurasia will control two of the world's three most, three most advanced and economically productive regions. A mere glance of the map also suggests control over Eurasia will give control over Africa. Well, maybe. Um, rendering the Western Hemisphere and Oceania geographic, geopolitically peripheral to the world's central continent. So there goes the United States, shunted off onto the side stage. About 75% of the world's people live in Eurasia, and most of the world's physical wealth is there as well both in its enterprises and underneath its soil. Eurasia accounts for about three-fourths of the world's known energy resource. So that's uh, Brzezinski, writing back in 1997. Next one, Mike. Now, I want to talk at Eurasia in US strategic thinking. And the point is that it's inherited from the British. And that is not merely for reasons of culture and history, et cetera, et cetera, but also, quite crucially, both are sea powers rather than land powers. And the, the key person is uh, Alfred McKinder. The next one. But despite his Scottish name, it's usually described as English. Um, so he's also described as the father of geopolitics or geostrategy. And there's two two important books, two uh, publications. Uh, 1904, The Geographical P Pivot of History, uh, where he introduces his pivot theory, where he has the, the world island, which is Eurasia and Africa, offshore islands as Britain and Japan, and the outlying islands, the Americas and Oceania. And then in uh, 1919, just after the end of the First World War, uh, he moved this to what became known as the Heartland Theory, and he came up with this little um, triplet. Uh, who, ro who rules East Europe commands the Heartland. Who rules the Heartland commands the World Island. That's Eurasia. And who ru rules the World Island commands the world. So the focus in that sense is on uh, East Europe because that's the key to the heartland. Right, and there's a, that's his map. So we might as well move on. Yeah. Am I going too fast? Possibly. Okay. Oh, sorry, yes, okay. Have you looked? Uh, the natural seats of power. So we've got the pivot area as wholly continental. The outer crescent is wholly, this one here is wholly oceanic. And the inner crescent, partly continental, partly oceanic. So that's the, the marginal land in between. So, we can see it's, it's very much a question of, of land power versus sea power. Now, this is 1904, and McKinder is saying the age of Columbus is over. Now, Columbus, for 400 years, sea power has dominated the world. Since Columbus went sailing the ocean blue, the world has been mapped. There's nothing left to find out. The world has been colonized. 
civilization spreading everywhere. Uh, and sea power has now sort of reached, it, reached its limit. And what is, what is happening at the same time is that land power is now in the ascendance. Um, now, of course, we could go into the question of the air and electronic modes of uh, affecting all this, but this is 1904, so he's just talking about land and sea. Looks at the pivot area, and um, that's that big continental inner, inner Eurasia, which in fairly recent historical times was, was controlled by the Mongols, the great Mongol Empire, the largest land empire in the world. Uh, and now controlled, well, 1904, by Russia. He makes the interesting point that, as he sees it, it was Asia that created Europe. It was the, the thrust of migration and threat from Europe uh, that created the Europe that we, from Asia, that created the Europe that we know today. European civilization is, in a very, very real sense, the outcome of the secular struggle against Asiatic invasion. And the key to these invasions, the key to the power of, of this pivot area is mobility. Now, of course, that's where Columbus had his advantage, because traditionally uh, it was the sea, it was the water, canals, rivers, and the sea uh, that allowed mobility. But the Mongols were different, because they had these, the horses, they lived on horses. Um, so that's in the past, but now, and this is 1904, uh, the key thing is the railways, beginning of the railway age. Next one. Right. Now, these are direct quotes from him. He says, transcontinental railways are now transmuting the conditions of land power, and nowhere can they have had such effect as in the closed heartland of Eurasia. Because um, railways transform uh, America, South America, we know, know that, but nowhere greater than Eurasia. The Trans-Siberian Railway is still a single and precarious line of communication, but the century will not be old before all Asia is covered with railways. The spaces within the Russian Empire and Mongolia are so vast and the potentialities in population, wheat, cotton, fuel and metal so incalculably great that it is inevitable that a vast economic world, more or less apart, more or less apart from the, the sea world, the maritime uh, commerce world, uh, will there develop inaccessible to oceanic commerce. Is not the pivot region of the world's politics, that vast area of Euro-Asia, which is inaccessible to ships, but in antiquity lay open to the horse-riding nomads, and is today about to be covered will, with a network of railways. There have been and are here the conditions of a mobility of mo military and economic power of a far-reaching and yet limited character. Russia replaces the Mongol Empire. Now, this is 1904, it's fairly prescient, I think. Uh, he, he saw things that most people didn't. And one example of that is, of course, China's Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which is a challenge to US, or challenge to seaborne commerce, which is, again, dominated by the United States, or controlled by the United States. And so it's a challenge to commerce and military power that is seaborne. Next one. And this is, this is an example. This is part of the American counteroffensive to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, There's an article from Washington Post, a triumphalist article a month or so ago. Um, Germany's China City doesn't want you to call it that anymore. It is about the city of Duisburg. And uh, next one, I think, we'll say more about Duisburg. 
Yeah, Tweesburg. Now, Tweesburg is the, U the European terminus of Trans-Eurasia Railways from China to Germany. And these railways offer faster and cheaper transit of goods between Europe and China. And of course, beyond China, you get Japan, you get Korea, you get Southeast Asia, and so forth. So they're cheaper and faster than seaborne um, commerce. Crucially, from the military point of view, they're not vulnerable to sea interdiction. Americans, as we know, tend to stop ships at sea. Uh, they control the seas. And so, crucially, we have the Straits of Malacca and the South China Sea are two choke points for China's foreign trade. And that, indeed, is why the Americans spend so much time in the South China Sea. They talk about freedom of navigation, but of course the real objective is to be able to stop the navigation because this, this is China's sea route. Um, so the inland routes are inaccessible to this. But of course the inland route is vulnerable to political pressure, which is um, the, the Duisburg uh, example. So because of American pressure on Germany, uh, because of the Ukraine war and various other things, uh, Duisburg as is um, stalemating uh, as a terminus for this railway trade. Um, I presume this will only be temporary, but anyway, the Washington Post was very happy to tell us that. So, if we go back to McKinder's geo geostrategic concerns on the next one. Yeah. Right. So we've got this pivot area, this huge area of, of inner Eurasia. Uh, and it's access to the sea, which is vitally important. And Mackinder's main concern was the addition of a, of a country with access to the sea. And here's a very nice racist, this is 1904, quote from uh, Mackinder. Were the Chinese, for instance, organized by the Japanese, this is of course the time of the Anglo-Japanese uh, alliance, so the Japanese were honorary whites, um, and they were seen to be the only Asians that could really organize things. Um, so the Chinese, organized by the Japanese, to overthrow the Russian Empire and conquer its territory, they might constitute the yellow peril to the world's freedom, just because they would add an oceanic frontage to the resources of the great continent an advantage as yet denied to the Russian tenant of the pivot region. Now, you may recall that one of the, the great problems for Russia, traditionally, still, is lack of access to the sea and to uh, warm water ports. Um, and that has uh, been a, a great, great problem for Russia. So, in this instance, uh, the, uh, the joining of China and Japan to Russia uh, solves that problem. But of course, Mackinder's main concern uh, was, was Germany. And so the other quote is, the use of vast continental resources for fleet building and the empire of the world would then be in sight. This might happen if Germany were to ally itself with Russia. So that becomes the big nightmare, or one of the big nightmares. China remains a nightmare. Germany is a more imminent nightmare. So we now turn to Mackinder's legacy. And the person I want to talk about inevitably is big new Brzezinski. I hope, I hope there are no polls in the audience to correct my, my pronunciation. Anyway, Brzezinski. So I want to talk about three stands of thought, two policies, and twin objectives. Next one. Right. Now, Brzezinski. He was born uh, in a Polish 
Catholic aristocratic family. All those three things are important. And in fact, the family comes from Western Ukraine, which was then part of, part of uh, Poland, which is a reminder, of course, that all the you know, state boundaries, territorial integrity is, is historically quite fluid. So Galicia? Hmm? Galicia? Galicia, yeah. yeah. Um, right, he was brought up in Canada, moved to the US, became an academic, then an official, and he ended up as the major, perhaps, strategist of US imperialism, uh, with um, Kissinger as his, his big, big rival. Hmm? He worked for Jimmy Carter. That's right. Yep, yep, for Jimmy Carter. Um, and of course, Kissinger has outlived him uh, and still going. Just had his 100th birthday, hasn't he? Anyway, uh, Brzezinski is very anti communist and anti Russian. Uh, the three stands of thought I within that, um, explain explaining why the virulence, if you like. One is class, he comes from Aristocrat aristocratic family. Secondly, ethnicity, Polish rather than Russian. And thirdly, Catholic. And here I want to quickly mention um, the great schism of 1054 between Catholic and Orthodox. A nice map on the next slide, just to remind us. And this actually explains quite a lot of what's going on uh, in the world, especially <laughs> within Europe, the great schism between the Western Church, the Pope in Rome and all that sort of stuff, and the Orthodox Church from Constantinople and, and Moscow. And uh, Kiev, we see up here, is in the, at this stage, is very much in the Orthodox area. Anyway, so Brzezinski is an aristocrat, he's Polish, he's a Catholic, and uh, that consumes his, a lot of his, lot of his thinking. Right, so his two major policies. One is the use of religion against the Soviet Union. And the prime example of that is inflaming and supporting Islamic jihadism in Afghanistan, the Muhajin. Um, which, uh, as we know, had various results. It led to the destabilization of Afghanistan, uh, the ending of the modernization project in Afghanistan, if you like, a Soviet intervention, and then withdrawal, the victory of the Taliban, 9-11, the US invasion of Afghanistan, and then Iraq, general devastation of the Middle East, with refugees to Turkey, and, and to Europe. <laughs> and, uh, right. Uh, so that was the result of his utilization, or major utilization of, of religion against the, the Soviet Union. The next one. And the second one, of course, is the use of nationalism uh, against the Soviet Union and against the Russian. Federation. So you can't use religion against the Russian Federation because the Ru Russian Federation is led by a very conservative uh, Christian. Um, I don't know if Radio New Zealand mentions that, do they? Not, not mm. so far as I know. No, <laughs> no. Anyway, um, but nationalism is still there, right? So, uh, and the key to the nationalism is NATO expansion. Now, the expansion, the expansion of NATO was uh, a betrayal of a, a promise made to Gorbachev um, by, I think it was James Baker, in uh, the time of the Soviet collapse. They said, not an inch, we will, move, we will not move NATO an inch further east. Um, but the, that, of course, hasn't happened. We've had this inexorable extension of, of NATO eastwards, heading towards Moscow. And this made crisis, and perhaps war, inevitable. 
And there have been multiple warnings about this. I mean, it's, it's all very well established. And here are some of the names, um, many more. George Keenan, which the architect of um, the Cold War, US Cold War policy. William Burns, who was uh, American ambassador to Russia and is now heading the CIA. And he sent a very important memo back to Washington. Um, oh, I can't remember the year, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, something like that. Uh, which was, it was subsequently leaked. It was confidential, but it was leaked. And it, it, the, 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 the subject line was, yet means yet, no means no. Uh, he's saying, when the Russians say that NATO expansion is red line, they mean it. John Mearsheimer, you might have come across him, famous uh, scholar, realist, uh, political scientist in, in the United States, does quite a few uh, YouTubes nowadays. Jack Matlock, who was the last American ambassador to the Soviet Union, and various others. So there is a sort of consensus that NATO expansion will be intolerable to Russia, and if you carried it on, something's going to happen. Um, and one of the, the sub-sections of, of that happening was, in fact, the uh, acceptance, perhaps the promotion, if you like, of ethno-nationalism within Ukraine, what are called neo-Nazis, uh, which led to discrimination against the Russian population of the Ukraine at that time, about 20% of the population, which then led to the, the separatis separatism in the Donbass. And from 2014 to from then on, there was a campaign by the government in Kiev, a military campaign to reconquer this, this area. And it's all to do with ethno nationalism. So instead of accepting Ukraine as a multi-ethnic country, the Russian Federation is multi-ethnic, the United States is multi-ethnic, Aotearoa is multi-ethnic, but these people uh, who took so much power in Kiev after the coup in 2014 uh, didn't want to have any of that. Ukraine was Ukraine and that was it. Next one. Right. So why is he doing this? Okay, so two objectives. One is a fairly obvious one, is destroy, destroy Russia as a challenge to US hegemony. Soviet Union, and Ru Soviet Union of course being the major challenge, Russia was a even the Russian Federation was a challenge to, to American power. So, Brzezinski wanted to destroy Russia as a source, a, as a challenge to American power. And the other objective is to detach Europe from Eurasia. And the two aspects of this one is the political. So, you wanted to make the aim was to make the European countries uh, hostile to the any powers within Eurasia. Uh, that's Russia, China, Iran, etc., etc. So you wanted this hostility. Um, and economically, you, he wanted, and not him alone, of course, uh, to detach and reorientate Europe away from Eurasia, which is its natural uh, uh, partner, economic partner, uh, reorientate it towards the Atlantic and towards the United States. And one example, of course, is the, the change, forcing the change from Russian gas uh, to U.S. Um, liquid nitrogen gas. Yeah? 
at sort of four to five times the price. Liquid natural gas. Uh, sorry, liquid natural gas, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll see scientists in the room. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, but anyway, there's the, the price differential. Um, and also to hamper Europe's trade and investment uh, relationship with, with China. Let's get back to that Duisburg slide. Now, the result of that, of this separation uh, that we've seen, especially in the last uh, year and a half, has been a trend towards deindustrialization and economic decline in Europe, uh, particularly in Germany, as the most advanced and, econo and major economy within within Europe. And you, uh, Germany. And the EU itself, the Eurozone, have just officially entered recession. So two quarters negative growth. Right. Now all sorts of complications and contradictions within these policies. Uh, one of them is that it's tended to force Russia and China together. Now, K Kissinger's great achievement was to separate the two. When he played the, the China card in the early 70s. Uh, but Brzezinski and Brzezinski's followers um, have, in fact, forced these two together. And so we get this, this question which keeps on surfacing about a war on two fronts. Now, most people, sensible people, think a war on two fronts is a nightmare. A Hitler certainly found out that it was a nightmare. That's the thing you really want to avoid, is war on two fronts. Uh, I don't know if Lincoln is quite so convinced about that. Um, so anyway, they, f they forced Ch uh, Ch Russia and China together. It resulted in the economic enfeeblement of Europe, now that has positive, from the point of view of, of America, positive and uh, negative implications. It lessens the competition to US corporations. So there's always been this competi competition between Europe and, and the United States. And so uh, if prices, energy prices in, uh, in Germany, for instance, skyrocket, what happens to Volkswagen and you know, Mercedes-Benz and, and Bosch and all these people? Um, so it lessens the competition, but it also lessens the value of these countries as force multipliers against Russia and China and anyone else. So the idea is that all these countries within the empire uh, multiply America's military force. And uh, so one of the effects now, despite the increase in military spending, uh, is basically that they're probably going to be less effective as, as force multipliers. Now, Brzezinski is dead, uh, with Kissinger dancing on his grave, no doubt. But his memory lingers on in the Ukraine war. And this is, if you like, uh, just like 9-11, very much a, a fruit of his, his policies. Um, the emphasis now is now on, on China, in Washington, the emphasis on China. But interestingly, Europe, I'll say more about that in a moment, still control US foreign policy. So now I want to turn basically to East Asia as the mirror of Europe, a mirror of Europe with this Eurasian framework. So talking about Eurasia, concentrating on, on Europe. Um, so I wanted to look at the US policy in this mirror, looking at commonality, differences, and then convergence. And the next one. 
Right. Now, US strategy may often be incoherent, subject to multiple pressures, there's constant um, policy conflict going on in, in, in Washington. Um, but basically, it flows from the same source, uh, towards the same objectives. And that is the expansion, the maintenance of hegemony. It's all about that. And so the disputes are about how to do that, not whether to do it. And th this involves control and utilization of foreign governments, economies, both the physical economy and the financial economies through, the, through dollar supremacy. Uh, control of land, resources, labor, military, the bases, 800 bases the Americans have around the world, and so forth. So these are all the, the mechanisms of this uh, expansion maintenance of, of hegemony. Next one. All right. Now, can I look at the, the differences between Asia or East Asia, many East Asia, and, and Europe. Um, so if we think of the United States as originating from Plymouth Rock, uh, the Pilgrim Fathers, uh, Plymouth Rock near Boston, it's all starting from there, so this little bit here. Um, so if you look north and south through the Americas, you get what might be roughly called soft imperialism, things like the Monroe Doctrine, which doesn't say that, doesn't officially say that the United States should control uh, the Americas, just say that no other country should, um, which ended up the same thing, of course, but still. Um, but this is fairly, fairly soft, self borders, soft imperialism. To the east, over to Europe, we have influence, a lot of power, uh, but it's influence power. Um, wartime intervention, the First World War, and then the Second World War. After the First World War, the Yanks went home. After the Second World War, they stayed. And they're still there. Uh, and so you, we get in, in Europe, we got all these American, American bases, which are very important. And uh, I mean, they use uh, the bases in, in Germany are used to control operations in Afghanistan and Africa and what have you. So the bases in, in Europe are, are very important. And then, of course, NATO. Not NATO. But where the West, going to the West towards Asia, things are very different because there it is basically physical conquest. From Plymouth Rock here, you get this conquest uh, across continental America, uh, taking land from Mexico, taking land from uh, the uh, American Indians and the Native Americans. Um, one of the great genocides in the world. Um, we get uh, here's some of the things. Uh, the Spanish-American War set things really going for in terms of foreign uh, expansion outside the continental landmass uh, with, uh, with Cuba and particularly the Philippines which became America's first major overseas colony. But also, during this process, we get this various islands within the Pacific are taken uh, by the United States, various forms. Guam is on that map, Hawaii, uh, and so forth. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, sorry, and then, of course, you get to China, you get to Japan, China, Korea on the far side of the Pacific, which then becomes an American lake. Now, despite this, um, and despite all these the differences we've been talking about, US foreign policy is, has been and is still
dominated by what we might call Euro the Europeans, people with European backgrounds, ethnicity. So Biden, of course, plays up the, the Irish card. Kissinger, Germany, Brzezinski, Poland, Ukraine, Blinken, who's Jewish and also from a family from Ukraine, Newland, Jewish, Moldova and Be Belarus, Albright, Jewish and Chechia, Pompeo, Italy, Kerry, as Jewish and Austro-Hungarian, and so forth. An awful lot more. Um, but there are no Asians, nobody with an Asian background so far at the top strategic level in the United States. So, I mean, that is interesting. So much of the expansion has been towards Asia. China is now the major enemy, but it's all run by these Europeans. Next one. Right. Now, the, the difference in sort of policies and, and institutions and so forth. So Europe, for Europe, the United States has NATO, which is a formal military alliance under US leadership, has 31 members and candidates, crucially uh, Ukraine, Georgia, um, and it's complemented by the European Union. Um, now, the European Union is nominally solely European. NATO uh, has, the, has the military alliance. The top person is an American general. The person who makes the tea, who does, the, uh, does a lot of the speeches and, and, and public awareness, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is the secretary general, uh, is European. Stoltenberg at the moment, though he's is uh, finishing up soon. Um, and they work very much closely together, especially on the, on the strategic aspects. Now, that's Europe, but we're in Asia. It's basically a matter of bilateral ties. Uh, they have, there are groups, but nothing really comparable to to NATO. So in the past we had CETO, uh, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, which was finished in 97. The Quad now, the Quadrilateral Alliance, Japan, uh, United States, Japan, Australia and India, but India is playing very hard to get. Uh, AUKUS, Australia, United Kingdom and uh, the US and uh, they've got their eyes on, on New Zealand. Uh, that's another issue. And the trilateral alliance between uh, the US, Japan and South Korea. They're all these basically a sort of bilateral alliances, hub and spokes and all that sort of stuff. Not quite the same as NATO, but next slide. Uh, it's unlikely, I think, that the United States will create an Asian NATO, and people do talk about it, but um, I don't really think that's, that's on the cards. For one thing, NATO is too democratic. Uh, the decisions on accession, for instance, have to be by consensus, and that's why Turkey was able to veto Sweden's uh, entry, because Sweden had uh, refugee, had um, political activists, Kurds, uh, was giving sanctuary to Kurds. So that was a dispute between Turkey and, and Sweden. Turkey was able to, to block uh, uh, Sweden's entry. Will there be a, a global NATO? Well, again, all NATO's wars traditionally have been what they call outside area. So we have this strange situation, North, North uh, Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, as they say, was uh, officially a defensive organisa organization concerned with the North Atlantic. Uh, its only wars so far have been aggressive wars and outside the North Atlantic. 
uh, been Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, and Libya. And the Ukraine proxy war is sort of an exception to that, it's coming back, back home. But at the same time, NATO is building partnerships in the Indo-Pacific. Next slide. Is that right? One more, one more. That's it. I'm not going to spend time on this, but anyway, the, the green is the partner partnership countries. Colombia, I, I don't know how exactly <coughs> how they get chosen, but anyway, um, the main things, main ones we're interested in: South Korea, Japan, Australia, and little New Zealand partners to NATO. Uh, so we get this expansion of, of NATO uh, throughout the globe, but not a, a direct, no formal, well, this is formal, but not the formal structures that you get in, in Europe. <coughs> Next one. Right. So, the convergence pincer. So, as I see it, there's going to be no formal Asian NATO or global NATO, um, but we get, in effect, this network of alliances to contain Eurasia, converging and intermingling. So in the li late 1940s, we got a pincer developed uh, in Europe against the Soviet Union, and then with the Korean War, uh, Japan, and base in, in South Korea, coming in on the other side, so a pincer on Eurasia. And what was separate in the past is now being melded into one. <coughs> so it's, uh, they're coming, coming together. So NATO in Europe and the bilateral alliances in, in Asia are melding with all these partnerships and various other linkages. And um, we get this concept of theatre combination. So we get the, the Royal Navy, for instance, sending its aircraft carriers off the coast of China, which must be one of the silliest things to do, but still. Um, the Luftwaffe last year was very proud that he was able to fly in 24 hours to Australia for exercises it was in, with air refueling. Uh, so we get all these European military forces being displayed uh, in the Indo-Pacific as a warning to China. Um, we get South Korea munitions to Europe. South Korea is now the major source of artillery shells and various other things uh, to, to, to Poland, then on was to Ukraine. Uh, interestingly, there's been no movement of troops yet. We haven't seen any Asian troops. The Europeans in Asia, but not Asians in Europe. Um, and then politically we get the, the NATO partnerships. Right, next one. Uh, sanctions. So sanctions is the uh, a constant, of course. Um, and these, again, are sort of joining in together because, because international trade is now so interlinked, and national supply chains, all that sort of stuff. Um, so we get sanctions against Russia, against China, uh, and all sorts of strange things happening, like um, Americans have sanctioned the Chinese defense minister, uh, Li Shangfu, over Chinese cooperation with Russia. And then, last week, they were very surprised when uh, he wouldn't meet with Lloyd Austin. They couldn't understand why <laughs> he didn't want to meet with, with the American Defense uh, Secretary. Anyway, um, but the interesting point about this, as in Europe, is that the Allies bear 
most of the risks and burdens of these sanctions. So European deindustrialization is to some extent being replicated in Asia. Not with energy, that was, that's the focus in Europe, Russian um, oil and gas, but things like semiconductors and the supply chain and so forth. Um, and in Europe, I mean both places, uh, because of these economic pressures, because of, of, of increased costs and the dysfunctionality that these economies are being forced into, we get relocation. So companies can't survive at home, they have to go elsewhere. So in Europe, and especially for Germany, um, companies are relocating to the States, some are going to China, um, and so forth. So that's a, a big political issue. And in East Asia, we get uh, pressure on South Korea, Taiwan, uh, semiconductor companies and various others, semiconductors is the, 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 the main focus at the moment, to relocate to the United States. And the result of all this is, as we might expect, trade deficit, economic decline, and even, this is an interesting one, threats of bombing. And so a few quick examples of those. I won't, time is passing, I won't spend uh, this is, okay, so Korea, uh, huge, Korea used to have very large, substantial, most of the time substantial trade, uh, trade surpluses, now it's uh, into trade deficits, and a major reason is the, um, it's being forced to comply with American sanctions against, against China, because China is a major trading partner, if you're not allowed to trade with China, then, of course, you've got problems. So there's South Korea. Next one. Uh, this is chips. This is the semiconductors. The CHIPS Act in the United States leaves chip makers, uh, semiconductor manufacturers, facing a choice between US and China. Uh, so their primary market and uh, an intermediate market, so forth, part of the supply chains, uh, was with China. If they're forbidden to do that, they've got problems, and um, they're being forced to re reorientate towards the towards the United States. Uh, right, next one. Ah, yes, I promised you something on bombing. This is quite interesting. Robert O'Brien, who was um, Trump's last um, national security advisor has come out and said that um, if the Chinese take over Taiwan, if the mainland China, if mainland takes over Taiwan, the island of Taiwan, the province of Taiwan, um, the US will blow up um, the semiconductor factories in, in Taiwan. Uh, the Taiwanese government was not too pleased of that. But uh, that's what he said. Whether they would actually do it, we don't know. But uh, the thought, the thought, perhaps it's a thought that counts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, the next one. Ne we're nearly at the end. Don't panic. Uh, um, yeah, remilitarization. So we're getting this. Both, both sides of Eurasia. Um, both the major defeated powers, the Second World War, Germany and Japan, are busy remilitarizing. Um, so Japan on the path to becoming a military greater power. Uh, despite its peace constitution, Japan is a uh, very formidable a military power and, and becoming increasingly so. Um, and uh, I say our friend, your friend, somebody's friend, <laughs> yeah, has just signed a military agreement with Japan. Uh, um, so, remilitarizing Japan. Um, we could say more. So, um, and then there's enhanced militarization. So, the countries which weren't officially uh, demilitarized uh, are 
being forced, uh, volunteering and what have you, to greatly increase their military expenditure. So here, our part of the world, South Korea, Taiwan, Australia, New Zealand, all upping their, their military military expenditure as part of this, this uh, policy. Next one. Right, so if we look at Eurasia and the flanks of Eurasia, despite all these differences, lots of differences there, but there is this overarching uh, commonality. Europe and Asia, East Asia, peripheries of Eurasia, um, and the constant theme of the United States has been the utilization and, when necessary, the sacrificing of vassal states. Through economic warfare, so we get the debilitating uh, Europe, South Korea, Japan, kinetic war. Uh, in Europe, we have the proxy war in Ukraine with significant NATO involvement in uh, training and weapons, in uh, intelligence and surveillance and reconnaissance uh, and so forth. And all the, the, the tanks, a lot of the tanks used in the current offensive are, are German leopards and things like that. Um, so there's a lot, a, lot of, a lot of NATO involvement and direct involvement, direct fighting between NATO or perhaps uh, NATO powers outside NATO, such as Poland, um, is, is a distinct possibility. There's a lot of talk, a lot of danger of that happening. In Asia, of course, we get Taiwan as the main bait, the idea that uh, the United States can force a war with China um, over, 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 over Taiwan. Um, and that, of course, would involve, obviously, Taiwan, but also involve uh, South Korea, Japan, Japan islands go within sort of sight distance of, of Taiwan. Australia, very keen to become involved, and, and New Zealand, too. Uh, but the difference, I think, in, in Asia is if there is a war with China, the Americans will be directly involved from the beginning because of their bases and so forth. Because they can't do a proxy war in the way that they, they can in, in Ukraine. The next one. And so this is a constant theme in the American foreign policy, military strategy literature, the battle for Eurasia. Uh, and this is foreign policy. So constant theme. The next one. Right. Now, I think we're reaching a tipping point in Europe. The US is facing failure in the battle against Russia. Uh, the Ukrainian offensive is having great problems, lots of, uh, losing lots of, uh, of um, tanks and, and fighting vehicles and personnel, etc., etc., gaining no territory of any significance. And all around there are increasing calls for negotiation to allow the United States to extricate itself from, uh, from this situation. And various reasons for doing that. Some people uh, want to do it so that they can concentrate on China. And uh, so here's what uh, foreign affairs, the big bible of, uh, of American foreign policy thinking. Um, talking about uh, the war against Russia is unwinnable and Washington needs an end game by which he means negotiations. He's got to have some sort of negotiations to get us out of this. Next one. And at the same time, there are doubts about war with China. Um, there have been various, over the last few years, lots and lots of war games uh, where they, you know, game war between the United States and, and China. And uh, from the American point of view, the worrying thing is that the Chinese tend to win. So that gives second thoughts. The other thing, 
and this is a really big one, is the munitions crisis. Basically, the United States and its allies can't produce the stuff needed for war, the tanks, the artillery shells, etc., etc. In the 1940s, the United States was called the arsenal of democracy. No more. It can't do it anymore. And so and there's a lot of, lot of agonizing over, over that within the literature. Next one. Right, so if Eurasia is undefeated, if the war against Russia doesn't work, if there's no war against China because it's just too difficult, or if there's a little war and the Americans don't do well, uh, then we're s you know, definitely in the age of multipolarity. Now, some people would say we're there already, but this will be a great transformation. Uh, Russia and China are the two twin giants of, twin giants of Eurasia but lots of others. Uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, India, Turkey, North Korea, etc., etc. Then when in the global south, you get lots of other countries who are now demanding a greater voice in international affairs and are standing up against American pressure. Um, are there many battlefields in this? The countries themselves? Many have refused US pressure to condemn Russia, to take out sanctions against Russia. These are the various swing states. Um, there's a question of, of financing currencies and the very, very big question of de-dollarization, uh, which is looming over, over the horizon. And then there's conflict within the organizations, the conflict between the concept of the United Nations and what the Americans call the rules-based international order, which means, of course, American rules. Um, this, uh, this SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and various countries are lining up, uh, joining a, a queue to line up, to join that, sorry. Uh, and then there's the BRICS. Originally, Britain, uh, Brazil, Russia, India and China, but now means something slightly different. And next slide. And this, in a sense, brings them together. A BRICS currency could shake the dollar's dominance. So de-dollarization and power moving in, in a multipolar world, uh, led by the other centers of power in the world, the countries of the, the BRICS. Next one. Okay, so we have this global challenge of American decline. So what should we do about it? Bolstering U.S. resistance risks economic uh, devastation, risks war, uh, conventional war, nuclear war. And so things like what New Zealand is doing, joining Alcas, military deals with Japan, weapons to Ukraine, uh, is helping America resist multipolarity. And the, the real challenge, what needs to be done, is to ease the United States into accepting the loss of hegemony, informal hegemony, and the arrival of multipolarity with other countries also being involved. And whatever the problems with multipolarity, because it's obviously not going to be an easy business, um, nevertheless, it is uh, the best framework for the future. We have to, in a sense, democratize the world. We have to let other countries, I say we, America has to let other countries have a, a much greater say in the running of the world. And that is the key, that's really the key problem, to get the United States to accept multipolarity. And this is my final line. If we're dead, this is John Maynard Keynes paraphrased, if we're all dead in the short term, the long term doesn't matter. Thank you. Uh, uh. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, try again. Thank you very much, Tim.
Right, any questions or comments or things people would like to ask or say? Yes, cover it. Can you use the microphone? Uh, the, the question is, I mean, um, Europe and Five Eyes um, basically in an information um, black hole where most people have absolutely no idea what's happening and what they're being told is mostly untrue. And it seems that's strengthening like the um, amazing thing that RNZ is now going back and correcting the corrections to the BBC and <laughs> Reuter articles. Um, what can we do? Right, let us um, say, I mean, it, it's the, the weirdest, most bizarre thing that's going on, because they add all, the, the words that were added with the, and the one evidence that we've been given publicly was a word like violent. Uh, this is terribly objectionable to the Ukrainian. Um, okay, I think we've got. Let's go back to the. To, let's go back to the. To, let's go back to the question, can we? To, and I'd like uh, Tim to answer if he can. Well, no, I think. Well, the question was, what can we do? Well, and I got yeah. nine. Criticize. Send letters of criticism. Well, yes, I don't know. Uh, yeah, no, this is. I think this. Uh, this is the, the the big question. I've, I've got no easy answers for it. Um, well, yeah, I'd like to offer one. Of, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah okay, oh. I, I, you, you go uh, first, Mary. Oh, I'm just wondering if, um, I mean, what, what's Really, I think a lot of us are looking for a peace movement that no longer exists. And I mean, I think that that's, that's part of the problem. How do you actually mobilise a peace movement? Um, given the kind of pressures to undermine uh, the, you know, a, a desire for th for that. Um, so I don't know, Michael. You might have a comment too, ha given your history, your long, your long history about how can we actually mobilise this and turn this into a kind of uh, a, a plea for peace and and diplomacy instead of uh, violence and militarisation. I think I think that's ex absolutely a, a crucial um, uh, uh, step in in uh, in the process. Yes, um, I think several things I think we can do, and one is to inform ourselves uh, about what is actually happening. And I think part of the why I'm you know so grateful for Tim's t uh, presentation tonight because what he's talked about is is what's happening in the world that is actually a positive in a lot of ways. And so there are a lot of, uh, I it's really interesting if you, if you look at um, what uh, China does in terms of the, the biggest country that's calling for peace at the moment is China. The most significant uh, diplomatic outcome in the world in the last uh, long as I can remember, is the peace uh, that China has brokered between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And whatever we think of those countries, Chi it's a massive achievement to bring together um, uh, Shiite Iran and Sunni Saudi Arabia, so they're now talking to each other. The Syrian, Syria is moving back into um, the Arab League, which it was expelled from. Uh, after actually Russian intervention, among other things. So, so getting information now, um, Tim mentioned Pearls and Irritations. That's a really uh, useful uh, website to go to because they're mostly Australian diplomats, former diplomats and academics, but they're all actually writing about peace and the problems in Australia, which is so close to us. Australia is also the country, of course, that twists our arms on everything they can, <laughs> arms and every other appendage they can get hold of, um, uh, uh, and and is quite militaristic. So there, so there are websites like that, 
I uh, read uh, Pepe Escobar, who's talked about the bricks and the Belt and Road for years. Um, and Tim has left us a, an article uh, here tonight that's available to take away. It won't cost you $50, which it would if you wanted to go via the uh, university or the way they run those things. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, yeah, we, we it, it, the peace movement has fallen on, on hard times. I, I'm well aware of that. Um, uh, but there are some shoots happening. So there is a group starting to resist uh, any notion that we should join AUKUS. And hopefully you will see some uh, further uh, um, e e extrapolations of that um, uh, soon. Um, the other thing I think is just is the sorts of things that uh, Kay does regularly is talk and write. Uh, put your views, uh, talk to people, and, and it's not easy uh, because, uh, you know, the, the, <laughs> the wash of propaganda has been very hard or very strong, and this is what this thing about that we're, that we're going through with Radio New Zealand at the moment, uh, which, is, which is, is, is uh, I hope, will open up a lot of things that um, <coughs> haven't been, because as one commentator said, to say that Radio New Zealand has been a, a pro-Kremlin is about as absurd as it gets. Um, so, so yes, the, the, the it is, it is. Um, but the the keys are, as always, I think, information, discussion, um, and and action where one can find things to do. Right. Sorry. I mean, I've I've. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm Lowell Manning, uh, for those who don't know me. Um, I wanted to come back on the genesis of the current foreign policy, if I can. Um, now that um, was developed in the late 1980s um, as the project for the New American Century. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's still today the baseline for all of American foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Now that policy was developed by a very small clique of people. Uh, you may know them or know about them. I do suggest that you all go and check this off because they're actually all of the same ethnicity. Um, and, um, uh, and, and so my question is uh, that that group of people is still dominant in the uh, policy establishment in the United States today, both in the military and particularly in the in the foreign foreign department. You know? So my question is, well, we can't do anything about what's happening in America, you know? but but can you conceive of some way whereby the power it's a massive power that they hold of those of the, those groups that small clique can be broken what you said it. Hmm? You, you, you said it's crumbling well i think american power is crumbling the power of the neocons uh, i don't know we uh, we if the situation in in ukraine deteriorates further this is going to pose huge problems for the, uh, the Blinken, and you know, Blinken is the, the modern Bulkovich, if you like. Mm. Um, what are they going to do? And we, you know, uh, it, it's, it's very worrying because uh, they might uh, escalate the war, they might go to nuclear war, they, you know, anything, is, anything is possible, because yeah. they're going to find it very difficult uh, to um, scale back. So, but, well, I, I think what I, I think to go back to what Margaret said. I think we, we can't directly influence that group of of people <coughs> who who have been consistently there for about ten or twelve through through several. But what we can do here is say we want we are standing for peace. I mean, why is New Zealand? 
uh, joined in, in, in a war in Europe? Why has New Zealand not saying we shouldn't be fighting that the Ukrainian people that are being sent to their death uh, in, in uh, that we, we should be against that and our government should be against that and you know we shouldn't be joining in uh, NATO which is a North American uh, uh, sorry North Atlantic uh, organization and we live in the Pacific uh, our background backyard is, is our, our part of the world is the Pacific and we wanted to stay demilitarized de and uh, denuclearized. So th it's up to us, to be honest, not to worry too much about them, but start demanding here now what we want to see and what we want our government and any government, uh, to be honest, uh, to be stressing, and that is peace. Uh, and um, okay, I think, I th oh right, okay. I was about to um, to uh, close on that note, to to <laughs> counterpoint um, to counterpoint yeah. uh, uh, Tim's uh, close uh, close here. Yeah, but, uh, but but the Americans that failed in Vietnam, that failed in Afghanistan, that failed in Iraq, that failed everywhere. Yeah, yeah, but but the point that but the, but the po foreign policy establishment, the whole workload there stays exactly the same, whatever we say. Yes, I know, and I know, and they. Are, yeah. But but what I'm saying, what I want to say, and what I want to conclude on, just so, is that that uh, it's we can do we we can influence what we can influence, mm -hmm. and we start uh, you, with anything that you want to change. You start by analysing where are you at, and what what could you do next, and what would be the most useful thing to do. And my suggestions are. Seek information. Seek information that is supportive. Don't read bullshit. Don't read all the things that make you anxious or mad. Or just, just. I get all of this stuff in my, in my news, in my email feed from people. Oh, what a terrible thing. Oh, don't go there. Just delete, 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 delete. What's, what's positive? What can take us forward? Uh, and particularly in our environment, uh, where do we? raise questions, challenge uh, uh, set beliefs, uh, and continue to argue for a peaceful Aotearoa and a peaceful world. And on that note, I'd like to thank Tim very much for his presentation, which I found uh, tremendous and, and I think, I hope, is the start of uh, a, a greater understanding about uh, what A is happening in our world and B, what we might do about bringing about a better one. Thank you. I should add that the presentation presentation it will be available on your website? Oh yes, yes, it'll be it'll it'll, it'll uh, it's gone out tonight and it'll be up on our website uh, as soon as we can get it there. Thank and there are don't forget Tim's article down the back.